first off, please, please don't touch anything. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, well, that's really the only rule. You're free to take pictures, uh, video. Uh, in, in a minute, we'll let you wander around a little bit to get pictures from the other side and this side. And I do want to introduce uh, Kent Fuller, who's one of our pilots who works for Northrop Grumman. So if you have pilot questions, you can ask him. I understand we're behind the schedule, so we won't be going to the ground station, but, but Kent can answer your questions. Uh, okay, well, welcome uh, to the Kent, Kent Fuller. Yes. Um, okay, so let me just give you a really quick uh, kind of overview of this project, and, and then we can get into questions and let y'all wander around. Okay, Global Hawk uh, was originally developed for the Air Force, and they built seven demonstrators that were all tested here at Edwards Air Force Base. And when the Air Force was ready to start building production airplanes, the demonstrators uh, were available for other uses. So uh, NASA requested uh, that the Air Force give us those uh, excess airplanes. And what you see here are two of those demonstrators. Um, the one closest to us here is the sixth airplane that was ever built. And the one behind it is the very first Global Hawk ever built. First one to fly, and it flew in 1998. Um, so we got these two airplanes about five years ago. And the reason why NASA has these, as you heard from Eric earlier, is to fly science missions. Uh, when you look at this airplane, obviously no pilot on board. So we can fly this airplane a very long time. It, it's flown, actually at this point, 29 hours in one flight, and we think it can go a little bit further. And when you think about that kind of amount of time flying, from here at Edwards, we could fly to New York, come back, go to New York again, and come back all in one tank of fuel. So this aircraft will go about 11,000 nautical miles on one tank. And so from here at Edwards, we've done things like fly up to the North Pole three times to take data. Uh, we've flown from here to the Atlantic Ocean and, and we've flown over hurricanes um, and gotten data. And, and I just said over hurricanes. You know, when you see uh, on, on the news uh, pictures of um, NOAA pilots flying to hurricanes, they're in the hurricane because they're down at lower altitudes in those airplanes. This airplane flies up to 65,000 feet. So we're up over the hurricane. We're looking down. With our instruments, we can see all the way through the hurricane down to the ocean. So we're essentially doing a CAT scan of a hurricane. Um, last, uh, last summer, we tried out a brand new ground station at uh, Wallops Airfield facility in uh, Virginia. And we flew uh, eight missions from there over hurricanes. Uh, so now that we can also fly from Virginia as well as California, we can be closer to weather phenomena in the eastern area. Um, okay, I mentioned uh, our pilot Ken Fuller works for Northrop Grumman. Uh, one very important aspect of this project is that we have a partnership between NASA and Northrop Grumman with these airplanes. And uh, also we have another Northrop pilot Steve Saprell who's just joined us. So when I, when I get done talking, you're welcome to talk to, to both of them. Um, so basically with this partnership with Northrop Grumman, uh, we have the manufacturer of Global Hawk supporting us and we support them. Um, Northrop supports us flying science missions. And, and then NASA will support Northrop when they would like to fly missions with these airplanes. So it's a 50-50 it's a partnership. Um, uh, half the pilots are Northrop. There, there's, there's NASA and NOAA pilots uh, who aren't here right now. Uh, when you look at the hangar crew in here, half of us are Northrop, half are NASA, basically. And um, let's see, I believe that's probably a pretty good introduction. I can start taking questions or, or the pilots. So. What makes the aircraft be able to travel uh, 30 hours at a time? Okay, well that, that's a really good question. Um, uh, this airplane was built largely out of composite materials. So 
So it's a lighter weight airplane, uh, especially when you look at this very long wing. It's a 116 foot span. That wing is mostly fuel tank. Uh, half of the fuel fits inside the wing. The other half fits in uh, two tanks that are in the center of fuselage here. Uh, so when, when this aircraft takes off, over half of its weight is fuel. So with, with that huge amount of fuel, and the engine is, is a very efficient Rolls-Royce engine, it, it only burns 81 gallons an hour. So you put that together, you get 30 hours of endurance. Uh, what kind of emergency procedures are different uh, on a plane like this versus a plane we would plane? That's a great question. I'll let them answer that. For one thing, um, we don't have to worry about uh, killing pilots or crew if the airplane crashes. Sure. So that makes a difference a lot on this airplane as opposed to the aircraft. This airplane doesn't have an engine that will restart because it doesn't have, does does have the restart capability. It doesn't have firefighting capability on the aircraft. So that uh, adds to the light weight of it, and that changes and modifies our emergency procedures. Also, operating in the national airspace system, we have different operating rules. So that changes how we operate in regard to emergency procedures. We can't just put it down anywhere. We have to go back to a field that we normally operate out of, or we have to find a place where we can uh, crash this into the terminal. Can you uh, broadcast a radio signal from this aircraft to a, a field somewhere Absolutely. on their channel? Absolutely. We talk to uh, air traffic control uh, basically by communicating to the airplane and then having the signal go from the airplane out to broadcast ATC in that region. Uh, thank you. It's just like a manned aircraft. As yeah. far as us sitting in the aircraft, when we're on the ground, we're talking just to ATC. Just switch sectors. In. We just switch yeah. frequencies every time we get the next sector and uh, just talk to them. And it's the same thing for coming well, to the control field like this. Okay, so let, let me just make a few more comments now that those questions have come up. Um, a little bit more about how we operate the airplane. We, we have a ground station in another building, and we have a pilot, co pilot, uh, a couple of other mission support people. And obviously, with these long missions, we have multiple shifts. So um, we'll typically fly three different sets of, of pilots during a mission. And those pilots are talking to the airplane through satellite links most of the time. When we're flying here locally, we have a direct line of sight UHF radio that we can talk to to command and control the airplane. When we're out beyond line of sight, we're using Iridium links, Inmarsat links. These are all satellite uh, constellations. So all the, all the commands to the airplane are going from satellite to the airplane and then coming back. And then there was a question about the ATC related. We also have a voice radio on the airplane. The pilots talk through the satellite to the airplane and the airplane transmits their voice to ATC. A lot of times the air traffic controllers don't even realize we're, we're an unmanned airplane because they're hearing the pilot's voice coming from the airplane and, and back. Um, and then one other note, this aircraft is autonomous. And what that means is there's a mission plan put in the computer and in theory, the, the aircraft would fly the entire mission without much input. That's not practical in real life because there's other traffic and we have to maneuver the airplane around. But when it comes to safety procedures, for instance, if we lost all ability to talk to the airplane while it's flying, the aircraft would sense that and it would come home and land all by itself. So it's a, it's a very powerful feature of Global Hawk in that it's autonomous and it knows what to do if we lose the ability to talk to it, basically. Are you guys getting ready for a flight like now? Um, we, um, we had hoped to fly today, but you probably noticed it's raining. We're just removing all the remover for flight tags, so... Uh, well, we're, we're about to do some tests. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to start up the engine or anything. Um, so, uh, we were going to fly today, but this aircraft does not have anti-icing on it or, or you know, ice removal, so uh, it's colder up there in the clouds, the icing conditions, so we could not fly today. So, we'll be flying early next week. What's the maintenance load on uh, on one of the uh, on one of the aircraft when it comes back from a mission? How much work has to be done on prepping to get it ready to go the next time? 
Usually very little. Um, the systems on Globalhawk are very typical aircraft systems. Uh, we'll do a post-flight, check all the systems out, but some, sometimes we do virtually nothing. Uh, you know, other times we, we may see an issue uh, that we have to repair, but it's very typical to a, a normal airplane. Most of the uh, maintenance during science missions is for the care and feeding of the instruments. That's why yeah. you see a lot of work. That, that, that's really what you see now. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ken. Um, this aircraft, uh, I'm sure uh, Eric told you, has 12 instruments on board, and you see these uh, these displays describing some of these. Uh, most of these instruments require some sort of work before a mission and then afterwards. Um, uh, so let me hit, hit on that a little bit. Uh, you see this uh, this big top area here. This is all a radon, and it's actually fairly empty in here. Uh, except for a big 48-inch satellite dish. And that dish we use to beam all the payload data to a satellite and then back down to here. So real time, we're getting all of the data from these instruments uh, during a mission. Is there a video the pilot can see? We have uh, a limited, there's a HS vis uh, visibility, HD, HD visibility, excuse me, uh, underneath the aircraft, which allows us to kind of see and then uh, sometimes in some missions we'll actually put a, uh, a nose camera in there. But typically, you know, we don't operate necessarily because uh, we have a, air, a truck that falls on the ground, which is our trapper truck, and they just follow, just keep our eyes on the ground. But once we're airborne, you know, we're pretty much, uh, as, as uh, Chris said, we're autonomous as well as also, we have our moving map displays and everything and our navigation, just like a normal aircraft. Do you fly land flight plans? Yes. Yep. It's kind of a modified flight plan because anytime we're operating in the national airspace system, we work under a COA with the FAA, which is a certificate of labor and authorization. So it's a, it's a specific route for a specific mission, and so we don't really uh, deviate from that, particularly over land. Out over the ocean, we have a little bit more flexibility. We squawk code? Yes, we do. Whatever ATC tells us to squawk, we squawk. And uh, one of the great things about this airplane, we, we can get up to 50,000 feet within about 40 minutes, and we do that here within the restricted airspace. So when we're going out to the NAS, we're already pretty much above what they care about. <laughs>